Hello and welcome back to the David Curtin Show here on today's News Talk TNT. I'm David Curtin and I'm delighted to have with me on the show Liz Evans, who is the founder and CEO of the UK Medical Freedom Alliance. Welcome to the show, Liz. Thank you very much, David. Thanks for having me on. Really excited to be here. Oh, it's great to have you on. You've got quite a resume. You are very, very well qualified, aren't you? You've got a degree from Cambridge and Imperial College, and you've worked in medicine for a long time. So you know all about those things. Can you tell us just briefly a little bit about um, you, you know, your background and how you got to do what you're doing today? Yeah, so um, I uh, qualified in the 1990s and I was um, doing my medical training and my medical um, sort of junior house officer and SHO roles in the 90s, early 2000s. Um, I actually then left medicine in the early 2000s, uh, became a full time mum. And when I went back to looking after patients, I went uh, retrained to do some complementary medicine. So uh, nutritional medicine um, and helping people to get their health better, you know, by uh, giving it the right ingredients, the right environment and empowering people. So I have sort of, you know, I, I've done both sides of the fence, uh, mm. but my medical training is really important to me. And I look, I've been looking after patients privately for the last 10, over 10 years now. And ethics have been sort of underpinning all of my career, whether it's been conventional or complementary medicine. Um, and so that led me uh, when the whole COVID thing started to um, just sitting in horror, actually watching the ethical violations that we were seeing, first of all, with the lockdowns, um, separating uh, people from their loved ones when they were sick and dying. Um, that was just so abhorrent to me. I could not understand how this was being allowed to happen because um it felt like there were red lines that shouldn't be crossed. So it really reconnected me to that sense of something's gone very wrong with ethics. Mm. And it seemed, you know, months went on and nothing was getting better. And I could see vaccine mandates coming and that worried me. And we had no medical freedom sort of uh, mm. movement in the UK because we'd never needed one. We always had voluntary medical treatment. So in October 2020, I put out a shout out on, on social media saying, please, are there other doctors, healthcare professionals, scientists, um, academics, anyone who believes in medical ethics, who's worried about the way things are going? And I was inundated with people saying, yeah, we need to do something about this. So we set up the UK Medical Freedom Alliance um and basically have been you know sort of hit the ground running and been uh campaigning pretty much full time ever since yeah you've done a, an amazing job over the last uh, few years against lockdowns against uh, coerced injections in in some cases almost forced injections with no jab no job regulation standing up for informed consent and uh, medical autonomy how do you see that there is still a threat to those concepts of informed consent and bodily medical autonomy today yeah i mean i would say we've we've got more of a threat now than we did say 3 4 years ago because of the precedents that have been set over covid um so we've obviously spent um, a long time just having to fight all the COVID policies because there were so many, you know, the mask mandates, mm. the visitor restrictions, the vaccine mandates, the um, the vaccine safety issues. Uh, we did a lot on that, especially relating to pregnant women, the ethics of giving it to pregnant women, giving it to children mm. uh, without the long term safety data. But we finally coming through that and, and looking in a wider sort of scope and realizing that there are ethical issues everywhere, particularly relating to our children, uh, mm. the wider vaccination program. I think uh, the whole experience of the last um, three or four years has made you made us all realize how uh, powerful the pharmaceutical industry are. They're a very powerful lobbying group. Um, mm. And what a great business model they have if they can get injections, as many injections into as many people, healthy people as possible, mm. you know, with as many boosters as possible. So I think we're sort of now seeing that this doesn't just apply to COVID, but this is, you know, the children's vaccine schedule, which has become huge over the last 20 years or so, 20, 30 mm. years. Um, and it, We've been looking at the use of schools. Uh, is this an appropriate place to be giving vaccinations? Um, 
you know, I know even I had, uh, you know, one or two vaccines in school. I think this has been going on for a long time. But obviously, as a parent, now I've got four children. I'm aware of how often these vaccine teams are coming into schools and I'm getting letters all the time. And you think um, this is a really unethical environment to give a vaccine because there is no privacy. There's no confidentiality. So if you have you know, you or your your parents between you have decided you're not having one. That is a very public decision, and it's very shaming. It's very stressful for children mm. who, because they won't be in the majority group. Um, and then you've got, you know, obviously um, there's that sense of peer pressure. So then the children can be coming in and demanding from their parents. It's that sort of pester power. All my friends are having it. You know, I want one, and the teacher says it's a great idea, and. You know, it, it's just taken this the sort of sober, responsible approach to medicine where you um, it's a pr private consultation with your doctor or your healthcare professional that knows you, that can discuss um, the risks, the benefits for you as an individual, not not for the whole population, but, you know, with your mm. own medical history. And then you make a decision in a completely unpressurized way. And the doctor respects that decision, whether you follow their advice or not. And that's the gold standard model for how um, a medical uh, consultation should occur. And that's obviously not happening when these external uh, vaccine teams come in and, you know, mm. all the children pile off to the gym and everyone sees the child who's left in the classroom who's not going. And, you know, it's just a really, really um, inappropriate way, I think, to be um, to be practising this, this sort of... Um, medicine yeah. yeah yeah i mean you've been doing a great job of highlighting this and highlighting the completely inappropriate use of schools to become vaccine centers or health centers i mean and also mm -hmm. you know the the blurring of the divide between education and health because up to a few years ago people would understand you go to school to learn maths to learn music to mm -hmm. learn sport languages you go to your family doctor to talk about anything to do with your health but now You've got health practitioners, if you can call them that, coming into mm -hmm. schools. And the children that are getting, you know, they, they have dozens or hundreds of them, you know, in a hall and they say, right, you're all going to get vaccinated now. There's no mm -hmm. informed consent. There's no explanation of the risks of whatever injections they're going to give to them. Uh, parents are left out of the loop almost mm -hmm. deliberately eh, because mm -hmm. I think they must know that there are lots of parents who are actually opposed to their children getting these injections. And, and even their own data shows, you know, even if you believe in the injections having some effect, which I don't, but even if you do, they were saying, well, it's not going to have any impact on children's health whatsoever. They'll be better off having... Uh, natural immunity catching whatever virus is there uh, and mm -hmm. getting over it themselves it doesn't provide any benefit whatsoever i mean i don't think that any of them do these uh, mrna mm -hmm. injections anyway we can talk about that uh, in a minute but let's stay with us uh, we're just going to have a quick news break now and we'll be back in a minute this is today's news talk tnt time to read some news tnt radio news Welcome back to the David Curtin Show. Liz Evans from the UK Medical Freedom Alliance is here. And uh, we were having a really good conversation about what they've been doing. They've been doing fantastic work over the last few years, standing up for people's medical uh, autonomy and against government tyranny. We were just talking, uh, Liz, about uh, how uh, health care if you can call it care, has gone into schools and is bypassing um, parents' um, uh, responsibility for their children. And there's this concept called Gillick competence in the UK. And uh, mm -hmm. can you explain a little bit about what that is and why that's important and what is happening uh, in that area at the moment? Yeah. So you were saying that obviously when uh, children are in school, um, parents aren't there to advocate and support them. So that's already parents have been sidelined. But even more um, sort of insidious is this idea that maybe children can start to consent themselves. So, you know, if their parents have not consented, well, maybe we should be able to ask the child. And this all comes from this idea of Gillick competence, which was a, a Supreme Court case in the 1980s. I think it was 1985. Um, which was trying to establish um, whether a doctor could uh, prescribe a contraceptive pill for an under 16 
um, if they were sexually active. So they were actually actively, you know, um, risking getting pregnant. And it was decided in a very detailed and long uh, judgment that, yes, in certain exceptional circumstances, you could um, a child may be able to consent for themselves. They may have the capacity, but that it had to be a child specific decision specific made by a medical professional who knew the child and their medical history and was able to assess their comfort, competence in being able to understand long term effects, side effects, risks, benefits. So all of that. So this is um, and it was even said very specifically in the judgment by one of the judges, I think it was Lord Scarman. This is not a carte blanche to be able to just, you know, all under 16s can, can consent to medical treatment. This is in exceptional circumstances. Mm. Um, and it was interesting, Bev Turner posted a tweet on Twitter yesterday, which um, it shows that the NHS is really now gunning for kids to be able to just automatically be able to consent themselves. And in this letter, inviting children uh, for an HPV vaccine, so they would be, what, 13 or 14, it said, mm. in the absence of a signed consent form from parents, we will invite the young person to self-consent for the above vaccinations, providing they can demonstrate understanding of the vaccinations due. Then worryingly, it says, ultimately, the decision to consent is the young person's choice provided they understand the issues involved in self-consent. This is in line with Gillick guideline, guideline competence. Well, actually, that is not. That is a complete mm -hmm. misuse of Gillick. You know, that, that you think you could possibly assess an unknown child within, what, a few minutes and, and, and sort of ascertain whether they have the full capacity to understand this on a big perspective. I, I think... This is really worrying. And I think a lot of parents mm. do worry that if they haven't consented to their ch child's vaccine, that the child will be put under pressure. And, you know, how many children are going to be able to with, you know, if all their friends are having it. And then, the, you know, the teachers are saying this is a great idea and they're being taught about this in biology as well. So it, it feels mm. like we're very much moving into I think this is a safeguarding issue because, you know, ch these sort of decisions should not be made without parental support and conversation and dialogue. Yeah, it's it's absolutely deplorable, isn't it? And, uh, you know, you talk about it being a safeguarding issue, but I think the government and the powers that be that are trying to change society will define safeguarding as whatever they want it to be. So mm -hmm. you know, if they want to safeguard children, as they say, from um, uh, non-trans affirming parents, you know, they might say, well, that's a safeguarding issue. But when it comes to injecting children with something that is an experimental or substance that has not been used before and we know is causing all kinds of harms well that's not a safeguarding issue but it, it seems to me you know from from things i've looked into and other conversations i've had there is a general move globally to assert children's rights whether that's children's sexual rights which is another issue but children's health rights competence over what they can do with their own you know medical Mm -hmm. um activity and so on um but this is very dangerous because it takes parents out of the loop and parents out of the equation and it gives government and big pharma the control of what happens to children yeah. and, isn't it? And, uh, well the and, state another... is stepping in isn't it to the family and sort of you know yeah. taking over which is you know we've seen in all tyrannical regimes in history haven't we we know that this mm. is a really bad sign um and interestingly i wrote an article recently it was in um conservative woman about a couple of letters we we became aware of of um children being uh contacted direct by um by mm. their gp surgery saying you now you are about to turn 13 and in one case now you're about to turn 11 you wow. uh, will have the right to make your own appointments to have control over your medical records if you want your parents to be involved you have to act actively opt in and fill in a form to consent to them being involved. I mean, this was just astonishing that, you know, it would be deemed, you know, acceptable in any way, shape or form that an, any adult could be writing directly to a 10 year old, mm. uh, which is not in their family. I mean, that is, you know, in any other walk of life, that would be a massive red flag, you know, and to oh. try and have this secrecy and confidentiality um, and keep the parents out of the loop of any any of their medical decisions. I mean, yeah, it's Look, just it, it, beyond belief. Yeah, 
Uh, you know, completely. I mean, th th this is something that shouldn't be happening. But the, what comes to my mind is I wonder how they feel, um, you know, that they can do this. The, is, is there some kind of regulation or guidance or new statutory instrument that says to the um, health organizations, which I think are part of the NHS, that they can do this? Because, you know, until recently, I don't think anyone would have even considered doing this, but there must have been some kind of tacit approval from somewhere for these um doctor's surgeries and so on to think that they can go ahead and contact 10 year olds but or is it just that the way society went mm. during covid i think it set it set this precedent and this idea mm. that the state can you know dictate to people how things are that that yeah. that suddenly families lose their right you know families lost their right to be with their loved ones that when they were dying mm. i mean it doesn't get much worse than that does it so in that sense suddenly the child the family is being now sort of framed as a, a dangerous place where, mm. you know, and the state needs to keep an eye on children and children, you know, might not be safe. But of course, that's in a tiny minority of families. That's not in the majority. But there's a sense of families are kind of guilty until proven innocent rather than the other way around. Yeah, that's it. We are, we are innocent until proven guilty and you haven't done anything wrong unless you've actually been gone through um, a court of law and been convicted mm. by a jury. That's how mm. it should be. And that's our understanding. But things are being completely inverted all over the place. That Liz, yeah. thank you so much for joining me on the show. I don't have too much more time, but it, did you just want to be, uh, briefly say where we can find out more about the great work that you're doing in the UK Medical Freedom Alliance? Yeah, so please um, do visit our website, um, ukmedfreedom.org. And um, we are a completely voluntary um, organisation, but we do have um, overheads and costs. Um, so we're always grateful for any donations that people can give us. Please do, you know, just donate because we really want to expand our work and get into there's so many issues, especially um, threatening our children um, from a medical ethics perspective. And we want to really start lobbying and campaigning on this so that people's rights are upheld, the rights that you actually do have, but which are being kind of um, walked all over at the moment. So, yeah, do do donate to us, please. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Liz. You're doing great work. Thanks so much for coming on the show and uh, all the best for everything you're doing uh, now. Thanks, David. And, and thanks future. for all your great work, too. Thank you. Great. This is today's News Talk TNT. Hi.